the City of Apache Junction City Council meeting to order. The invocation will be led by Vice Mayor Wilson and the pledge by Councilmember Evans. Heavenly Father, we are gathered together again this still very warm uh, evening to perform city business. We ask for your continuing oversight of us and our staff as we continue to keep Apache Junction a great place to live, work, perform business, and raise a family. We are encouraged with the cooler temperatures in the early mornings to return to our many outdoor activities. We all enjoy your creation and are anxious to return to our normal activities. We also ask for your continued oversight of our nation as we come to the polls and vote. This nation was established on the idea that citizens of our community and our nation elect our leaders and has worked for well over 100 years and to desire it to continue for many hundred years more into the future. We as a council encourage everyone to vote. We also want to ask for your protective hand for our first responders as they continue to protect us and our belongings, keep them all safe, and we extend this to our military members and their families <clears throat> from our community, wherever they are serving throughout the world. Keep them all safe, bring them home at very soon. In the Lord's name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Mayor Surdy. Here. Vice Mayor Wilson. Here. Council Member Barker. Here. Council Member Evans. Here. Council Member Rizzi. Present. Council Member Schroeder. Here. Council Member Strubel. Here. You have a quorum, Your Honor. Do we have a motion on the consent agenda? Your Honor. I move that the consent agenda be accepted as presented and that resolution number 20-34 authorizing the city to enter into an agreement with the U.S. Department of the Interior Bureau of Land Management for preparatory rodeo grounds purchase costs, and that the First Amendment for janitorial services between the city and JB Superior Maintenance Services for additional services for five parks and recreation facilities in the amount of $65,340 a year be approved. Second. Roll call. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Strubel? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. You noticed on the agenda that there was going to be a 40 year service award for Keith Bedwell of Public Works. He could not make it. So in two weeks, we're going to give him a 40 year and two week service medal. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a proclamation for domestic violence awareness. Whereas anyone can be a victim of domestic violence, regardless of age, sex, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, or religion, and whereas domestic violence in any community may exist as a hidden, silent, and often unrecognized reality that is often not reported to authorities, and whereas there is a need to challenge the assumptions made about domestic violence, become proactive in preventing domestic violence, and hold offenders accountable, and whereas the City of Apache Junction, the Apache Junction Police Department, the Community Alliance Against Family Abuse, and other agencies, organizations, and state coalitions across Arizona and the nation are committed to preventing domestic violence by promoting prevention, awareness, campaigns, educating the community, and advocating for victims' rights. Now, therefore, I, Jeff Surdy, Mayor of the City of Apache Junction, Arizona, do hereby proclaim October 20th as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Apache Junction and urge all citizens to work together to prevent domestic violence. And I think we have a board member, Sharon Steinard, from the board to accept this, and I'll come down and get it to her. So nice to see you again. <laughs> a 
Announcements of current events. Your Honor, before I didn't get this to you, but before we move on, I do have a video that I'd like, I'd like to share regarding national domestic sure. violence. Is it okay if we share that from the governor? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hello, this is Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Everyone deserves to be safe at home. But sadly, each year, millions of Americans suffer from domestic violence or abuse. People from every age, every race, every gender, every religion, every walk of life. In fact, one in four women and one in 10 men have experienced some form of sexual or physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And one in nine children have been exposed to some form of family violence. This October, as part of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the Arizona Capitol Building will once again be lit purple as a symbol of hope and support for domestic violence survivors. I encourage every Arizonan to join us in showing your support by lighting your homes and businesses purple throughout the month. Across the country, challenges related to COVID-19 have increased risk factors for domestic violence. So now more than ever, we must stand up to stop domestic violence and help get survivors the support they need. If you know of anyone who may be in an abusive relationship, help is available 24 hours a day by calling the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800 799-7233 to find out how you can support domestic violence awareness, education, and prevention efforts, please visit itcanstop.az.gov. Together, we can make a difference. Together, Arizona can stop domestic violence. Thank you. And you'll notice City Hall's lit up purple. Did we do the focal point too? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Your Honor, thank you. I just wanted to show that, and, 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 and like I said, more than ever, this is our time to work together, and we are so grateful for the partnerships like CAFA and so many families that work in partnership with this important issue. Thank you for your support in adopting this proclamation. It shows great leadership to the men and women of our police department as well, and so many others that are involved. Thank you. Okay. Current events will start on the Jeff Struble side. Okay. I got a couple things. Uh, that's the first one is um, back in May when um, the schools were um, doing virtual, going or not in, we decided to um, honor our, our graduates by giving them a gift certificate to some local restaurants. And it's, they're still good through December 31st. So if you guys know of anybody who graduated from one of the high schools here in AJ, it would be AJ USD, um, Imagine Prep and the high school, um, the, the one on the 60 there, the Apache Junction High School. If you know of any of them that have one of these certificates, they're still good through the 31st. We have the money available through the LDR Foundation, so really encourage them. It's, it's something that helps the um, local businesses by bringing people in there and hopefully spending more money than just $20, but um, just remind the kids that they're still available. Then, what else was the next one? AJ Open Mic Night, we're doing that again this Friday night at the Table of Grace Church. It's another avenue where we um, highlight the, the talents of our young people and our older people. Um, and we do everything from music, poetry, um, comedy, whatever it might be. Um, so if you have anybody who would like to come and show it off, it's not karaoke. It's a place where you can come and play your own instruments, sing songs, um, do whatever it might be. So. Um, it's a great avenue for that. The next one is Project Showers. Again, we had a great showing this two weeks ago. We have another one this, um, this Sunday. We actually had 76 meals, um, seven or eight showers. And it's not, the showers are for anybody who needs them and actually the, the, the food is for anybody who feels the need to come and just get, get fed for the day. Um, so there again, it's um, at the, the Salvation Army um, just come and enjoy some fellowship and all that um, that goes along with it. 
Then we're doing the fourth annual AJ Kids Idol this year. We're starting the auditions. So for there again, if you know of anybody who, any children K through 12 who either live in or attend um, school in Apache Junction, um, we're having the um, auditions on August, or excuse me, October 22nd, October 31st. That's a Saturday, that one will be in the afternoon, and then November. Um, and you can contact either myself or Braden Biggs for that. And um, I think the last one is, yeah. The celebration for veterans is, um, that's July 11th, or excuse me, July. Oh, hi. Uh, November 11th. Um, I'm sorry, I do taxes. My brain is all over the place. Um, different years, different months, everything. But September 11th, excuse, November 11th. And this year, it's not going to be at the park. It's going to be down here on Phelps Avenue at the VFW. And so just come down and enjoy um, the celebration of our veterans, the, the people who, who served to protect the rights that we have. And, um, and uh, there's going to be some festivities going on. And uh, like I say, the venue is going to be changed. I don't know if anybody else is going to talk about it, but I just wanted to get out there to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Councilmember Evans. You might notice I'm not wearing purple tonight like most people are. It's <coughs> kind of a different version mm -hmm. of purple. But this coming Saturday, the first Saturday in months that's supposed to be under 100 degrees, <laughs> we're having our second Make a Difference Day. It is, unfortunately, had to be way scaled down from our first one where we had over 150 volunteers, but because of the COVID and the regulations that the nonprofit, the Community Development Corporation has to abide by, um, it's been greatly reduced. We are going to do a cleanup around the focal point. We are going to do a, the eighth mile botanical walk at silly mountain there's a group out there that is going to be cleaning up the desert and unfortunately someone stole a bunch of the cactus out there and with assistance from the city they were kind enough to share some of our um, from the focal point the yellow cactus are going to be planted out at the botanical walk and we do have one code case family um, to help clean up, but it's sort of a special case, and the way we have to do it is sign up is at 8 o'clock Saturday morning at the focal point. Um, if you're going to go out to the botanical garden area at Silly Mountain, we ask you to just go there directly. At the focal point, we're going to have two um, dumpsters for people that have the ability to, that can bring some um, trash or junk and drop it off there. Um, and none of this should take very long because the projects aren't that big except for the one family cleanup is kind of significant. And that we're sort of concerned about having a lot of volunteers over there for some safety reasons. Um, I would like to thank Sandy Russell from the Modern Woodsmen of America. They donated $1,000 to the CDC, and we were able to finally put that towards buying shovels and rakes and gloves so everybody doesn't have to bring their own. We'll be able to supply that as time goes. Republic Services donated the four dumpsters. Ace Hardware donated equipment. And of course, the city, with the aid of the different departments, donated some cactus. Mm -hmm. So it truly is a community effort. This mm -hmm. year, we're not going to be able to um, go down the median like we did last year. But that is going to be a different event come November when it's a little bit cooler. Um, it's open to anybody that wants to help. Just come at 8 o'clock to the focal point, sign up. If you have trash or things you need dumped, please feel free to bring those. Just no hazardous waste. If you have any questions, you can talk to me afterwards. Vice Mayor. Yes. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm 
kind of talking to a limited uh, number of people out there, but uh, well, as some of us may have heard already, um, the sewer district um, has uh, stopped taking horse manure as of this past Friday. And I've received a couple of emails and I wanted to quickly address it. Um, the reason for the stoppage is not because of the horse manure being causing a problem or w what's going into it. It's the EPA has uh, a rule out there on what can and cannot be in uh, compost material, which is what the horse manure was used in conjunction with the human waste that was uh, composted. And that material has been testing, um, I would say bad if you want to call it, um, and so therefore they have elected to stop composting uh, the material uh, until something that can be done to resolve it. They are currently working with other waste man management uh, industry um, in trying to resolve the issue um, and they want to get back and starting on it again because it uh, works very well and it's very servicing to our community. But unfortunately, right now, they can't see bringing in the additional, I'm gonna call it the weight, that they have to turn around and haul off. And uh, it costs them a lot of money to haul this stuff off. So uh, uh, unfortunately, it's stopped for right now. Um, we're working on possibility trying to see what we can do by offering some additional avenues, but uh, we're going to struggle through this. And I encourage people to uh, to stay tuned and figure out what we can do. Robin? Um, no, I don't have anything. Oh, you See, said I Robin. I said Robin, but now I'll say Robert. <laughs> no, I don't have anything, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Robin. I've spent the last week on Zoom. I've become very proficient at Zoom. Um, the MAG regional meeting, domestic violence meeting, and uh, the economic development meeting, and economic development 101 for elected officials. That's very interesting. If you haven't been on it, check it out. It was. Very interesting. Another one this Thursday. And anybody can go to that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You just have to register and okay. go. Krista. Okay, I just have one. If, if you notice, if you go around town, it's election season and everybody hates the signs, but there's been a lot of vandalism and damage <laughs> to certain signs. And it's not worth it if you get caught. I mean, our, I believe our PD is, is looking for them, so, and they will prosecute. I mean, it's, it's very serious and it, it doesn't help either side. So just let them, let, you know, let our, system take, you know, work. And, and I know signs cost quite a little bit of money. And yeah, and the effort to put them up. And then, you know, it just makes, it makes whoever does it look bad, not the other way around. Uh, I want to talk about the medians also, and then I'm going to hand it off to Bryant. Uh, and if you go down, anybody that goes down Royal Palm, it's a great example of what you can do to enhance the medians. Those trees, even in a poor summer we had with no rain, they, they're still thriving over there. And uh, you'll see the work out there right now, Bryant. Um, that's my last one, if you wanna just take yes. it from there. Well, thank you, Your Honor, Bryant Powell, City Manager. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so starting here this Saturday and future Saturdays, you'll see more public works and Parks and Recreation Department staff out in the median in the Apache Trail. Near the Ironwood area, you'll see some drainage projects that are gonna eventually culminate in some plantings in, with some groups in in November. And so this has been a longstanding effort to get the median to look great. And uh, we, um, we wanted to let the community know that there'll be some, this project will be going on. And then Your Honor, I'm very pleased to have with us here tonight a special presentation regarding the accreditation uh, through the Arizona Law Enforcement Accreditation Program designed to ensure compliance and establish standards. I am very proud to say that our police department not only won asked for, but embraced the idea to come and look under the hood, have an opportunity to measure 
uh, against our practices and our policies and have a full evaluation. And so tonight, um, Chief, can we turn over to you or first and then you can do the introductions of our guests. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, staff. Uh, so this evening, I'm gonna hold my closing remarks toward the end, but um, uh, it, this was a long process. Uh, it wasn't an easy process and every member of the department played a role in it. Um, but without too much further ado, I'm gonna, the two members that are gonna represent or do this speaking is uh, Kevin Ray from the uh, uh, accreditation, he's a program manager for the accreditation uh, program. And then Chief uh, Pete Wingert from uh, Paradise Valley is one of the board members. And they will probably go in a little more detail in regards to some of the things we had to go through. But if I can have uh, either one or both of you come up. Yeah. <coughs> Obviously, the one in the uniform is the chief and the other one is <laughs> not. It's not the chief. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, council members, it's a great opportunity to be here. My name is uh, Pete Wingard. I'm the chief of police for Paradise Valley. I'm here tonight with uh, Kevin Ray, who is the uh, program manager for the Arizona Law Enforcement Accreditation Program. It's truly a, an exciting day when we can ex extend accreditation uh, to a most deserving police department. In 2017, the Arizona Association of Chiefs of Police, along with our partners, the Arizona Risk, Municipal Risk and Retention Pool, the Arizona League of Cities and Towns, and the Arizona Peace Officers and Standards and Trainings started the journey of developing a statewide accreditation program to establish a set of best practices for the safe, effective, efficient, and non-discriminatory delivery of professional law enforcement services in the state of Arizona. Chief Kelly was a member of the ACOP executive board at the time and was a champion of the program, assisting in developing the standards based on his many years of law enforcement expertise. The Apache Junction Police Department was one of the first agencies to enroll in the program, beginning their self-assessment period in uh, September of 2018. Over the next 20 months, the agency staff, led by Lieutenant Jeff Kirkham, worked diligently to ensure that they had policies and proofs of compliance for all 174 standards. On June 16th and 17th, the Apache Junction Police Department participated in an on-site assessment conducted by uh, Lieutenant Brian Zack of the Kingman Police Department and Lieutenant Shane Sloma of the Lake Havasu Police Department. The assessment team spent two days in your community inspecting every facet and function of the agency, interviewing staff, city personnel, and community members. The assessors inspected all the divisions from, oper from the operations division to the criminal investigations, records, fiscal re responsibility, and the property room, and the dispatch center, and found the AJPD to be an extremely professional and organized agency. Chief Kelly's commitment to the community and agency were on display, and his goals of providing courteous public safety services to all people, partnering with the community, and developing and maintaining a professional organization were all observed and noted in the assessment team's report. During the on-site assessment, Assessor Sloma completed a ride-along with Officer Josh Hooper. Officer Hooper was dispatched to a report of a stolen vehicle. Officer Hooper told Lieutenant Sloma that he was going to find that stolen vehicle and began searching the areas of the community. A short time later, Officer Hooper found the stolen vehicle and apprehended the driver. This level of dedication and commitment to crime solving and other community issues is indicative of the value that your police department brings to your community. The assessment team repeatedly noted the culture of the organization, that the policies and procedures Chief Kelly and his leadership team have in place are reflective of the values of this community. It was clear that the members of the AJPD were engaged, committed, and proud. They were proud of the service they were, that they provide, the city they work for, and most of all, the community that they serve. On behalf of the Arizona, law, Arizona Association of Chiefs of Police and the Arizona Law Enforcement Accreditation Program, we would like to recognize Chief Kelly 
and the staff at the Apache Junction Police Department on this tremendous pro professional accomplishment. Chief Kelly. It's a great honor to present that. Thank you. Al, can we get a few photos here? Yeah. Your Honor, if you haven't, no, we have in the lobby some of our finest AJPD officers, men and women, watching. I was wondering if we were expecting trouble tonight. Well, they can come in, and I don't know if they can come in. It's kind of getting full in here, but it's awesome <laughs> that they're here. And we could even get a picture with everybody in here. Yeah. Alf, can we move everybody back under the a little bit here, a little more rooms? And do we want to bring some of the officers, no, you Mayor? See the shirt. Sure. Yep. <laughs> Chief, we're going to really embarrass them. So let's go back against the dais here a little bit, and that's the good light. so big, I, they won't see me. <laughs> oh, this is fun, right over the head. <laughs> On his arm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just do this in front. Rabbit ears. Yeah, we were we were That's back good. here with this. <laughs> Ooh. You'll never know till you see the picture. <laughs> Thirty, Vice Mayor Wilson. Uh, again, it truly is an honor to be here tonight to recognize the Apache Junction Police Department. Uh, it has truly been uh, my honor and pleasure as being the program manager for the uh, Arizona Law Enforcement Accreditation Program to work with the men and women of the Apache Junction Police Department. Uh, you have so much to be proud of with your police department. Um, we have two of your lieutenants who actually serve the program uh, voluntarily as assessors um, so the, the the knowledge and expertise uh, that lie right here within this community uh, you should be extremely proud of your police department because uh, I can tell you that uh, on behalf of the Arizona Association of Chiefs of Police we're extremely proud um, in uh, in the um, in the times that we have seen recently we've seen a, um, a slight uh, decrease in public trust in police departments um, and I think that it's really important to understand that all of the resources that you give this police department are utilized uh, professionally are utilized um, to do nothing other than to serve your community and to um, and to do that very well uh, in the near future you're going to see the logo of the accreditation program except for at the bottom where it says accreditation program this one says accredited agency. Uh, these will be emblazoned upon the patrol cars. Um, so um, whenever you see that, um, just, just think of, of this moment right now and how proud you are, your police department, you have every right to be, but how proud um, the uh, Arizona Association of Chiefs of Police and really all the law enforcement agencies in the state of Arizona are of your police department as well. Thank you, Chief Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kevin and Pete. Appreciate you driving all the way down from that other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I wanted to do is just in closing, um, this was one of those adventures we had uh, taken a challenge on, and Lieutenant Kirkham, if I can have him stand up again, can embarrass him even more. Uh, he was kind of put on, not kind of, he was put on the spot. Uh, he was challenged with the fact that not only was he updating our policies along with your city attorney and making sure they made, this, made the standards of today's world's 
use of force issues and a lot of other issues, but on a regular basis between the city attorney and the city manager's office, these are routinely passed through me, through them, to Bryant, and then he eventually approves the, the policies that you currently see. But they're also meeting some very stringent uh, legal standards. Um, so when the challenge came out, and I'll go back and reflect uh, when I was on the <coughs> uh, association board, um, Chief uh, DeVry that of in Kingman is the one that had kind of the vision to develop this program. And it was back seven years ago, eight years ago, when I, I, I forget, it's about seven years ago when I was on the board. <coughs> Bob was uh, very passionate about getting accreditation. And there are some national accreditations, but this one is very unique to Arizona. Uh, we deal with things that other states don't do because we deal with tribal communities and a lot of the other things that some other states don't deal with. Um, this program has been forwarded to the Department of Justice for their review. Um, uh, their committee ha has been given a copy of our accreditation program, and I don't know where it'll come from there, but it is one of the programs that they're looking at as, as a, um, I won't say model, but a, a one that they can compare it to. But anyway, uh, Lieutenant Kirkham was challenged with this, and it took untold hours to uh, go through each one of the policies, reading them, deleting things, either manually or even trying to find out what the most current laws were. And again, between the city manager's office and the city attorney's office, each one of those documents had to go through them. But it was through his um, pain, sweat, and my whining and complaining <coughs> that he finally succeeded doing it. And when it came down to getting the assessors to come out, and I said, are we ready for it? Because originally, Jeff told me that he would have this done in three months. <laughs> <laughs> a year and three months later, <laughs> he was still creating documents. But it's not just Jeff, or it's not just me or our command staff. The entire police department played a significant role in this. Each one of them played a role in trying to get the documentation. And the documentation, as was stated before, we had to have proofs of that, what we did. So whether it was a police report, or a photograph, or a piece of evidence, or whatever it was, had to be proof. When the inspectors came out, they looked at it, in fact, we had something where I think one of the <coughs> jokes that Jeff decided in his sick sense of humor was there was a point in there to want to make sure that our <coughs> reserve officers and our police officers had the same uniform. They do. So we took a picture of a reserve officer, <laughs> said reserve, and a regular police officer to show that we do have the same uniform. But it was one of the ones he was going like, why are we doing this? We have the same uniform. But we had to prove it. It wasn't just because we studied it. But he put a lot of work in it. And he, 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 to this day, continues doing it. In fact, there's two or three sitting on Joel's desk right now that have been updated. But it's very important right now, especially as was stated, what's going across the country about defunding the police department and the transparency and the community support that we wouldn't have unless we had a city council that supported us and a community that backs us. And this community does an amazing job. Um, one of the officers said the other day, he can't go down the street without somebody stopping and saying thank you. That doesn't happen everywhere. And if you look at Portland, those poor guys that have been out there 115 days still, they're not getting any thanks at all, not even from their city council. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Bryant. Appreciate the support. Uh, you two guys, appreciate it. I couldn't have asked any better. I know uh, the, uh, ch the actual president of the uh, ACOP was going to be here tonight, but he had a council meeting that he had to present something with his city council tonight, so he wasn't going to be able to be here, but I appreciate it. Kevin gave me some challenge coins to give out to the city council, and the challenge that I would give you and us is, um, first of all, find out what the history of a challenge coin is, if you don't know, <laughs> and uh, challenge us to continue giving you the service that our community can serve. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, that concludes my report. Just a huge thank you to Kevin and Chief for coming tonight. Thank you. And to Lieutenant Kirkham and all the men and women of the Apache Junction Police Department and our community for being prepared in this moment to be able to, to take on this assessment. Trust is earned. And we got to continue, and we'll continue to do so. And we appreciate everything that you do to help support our Apache Junction Police.
Krista has a comment. Um, Your Honor, thank you. I, I just wanted to um, point out in the presentation from the organization that um, did the presentation that um, to the public, in case you missed it, 174 categories were looked at in the police department. So this wasn't just a, a matter of filling out a little form and getting a few brownie points. 174 things were looked at in our police department for them to get this. So this is a big deal. And when we see our officers, it is a big deal to thank them. We have some uh, people in the community that are saying prayers for our officers, but it, it is a big deal that we thank them and let them know how much they are appreciated. This is awesome. Great, great job, Chief. Thank you and the department. Thank you. Presentation, discussion, public hearing, and consideration of ordinance number 1496, case PZ6-20, a request for by ME Investment Group. And this is going to be Kelsey. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, my name is Kelsey Shatnick. I'm a planner on staff. And this is a planned development major amendment of the property at 1081 South Meridian. So this property is located just south of Broadway on the east side of Meridian Drive. This commercial property is um, surrounded by residential on all four sides. The current zoning on the property is general commercial by plan development or B1PD. And the request is to amend the plan development in order to allow an expanded palette of uses. Um, there are no on-site improvements being proposed at this time. So this property has been developed with a commercial use since at least 1985, but has had a long and complex zoning history. Um, in 1995, an ordinance approved rezoning from trailer home site to neighborhood commercial um, and convenience store to allow the use of a beauty shop and resolve nonconforming issues. Then in 2004, a plan development approved a small courtyard office complex with a small pallet of office related uses and for reasons unknown, the development plan fell through. Then in 2005, um, an ordinance repealed um, Ordinance 1207 and approved a larger pallet of uses on the property. And then in 2014, the property was inadvertently rezoned to RS7M and was went through a city-initiated corrective rezoning again in 2016. And then earlier this year, the property owner approached us about expanding the pallet of uses that are currently allowed on the property. So this is a list of the current uses that are allowed on this property. Um, there are about 35 total, so there are a few, but it is fairly limited. Um, and the property owner expressed concerns about being able to potentially rent or sell the property if he chooses one day. And staff worked along with the applicant as well as the property owner to come up with a list of uses we thought were appropriate for the property. Um, I'm not gonna go through them all because it is a long list, but the proposed permitted uses, um, there are about around 80, 82 total. And then with proposed uses permitted by a conditional use permit, it brings the total up to be around 90 uses on the property as opposed to the original 35. And then this is a list of proposed unpermitted uses on the property. In terms of public input, the applicant sent out mailing notices on July 17th um, to all property owners within 300 feet. Two residents were concerned about medical marijuana and alcohol being sold um, or a potential use on the property and they were assured that neither of these uses would be allowed. Um, the city also sent out public, he public hearing notices noting the time, place, and proposed requests. We received one call regarding the PD amendment, basically just wanting to know if anything was being proposed at this time. So at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting on September 8th, um, the biggest discussion was whether or not used car sales would be allowed on the property. Um, one commission member thought that no car sales should be allowed on the property, but it was um, finally determined that uh, used car sales would be permitted by right with no service or repair on site, and then used car sales with service or repair would be permitted by a conditional use permit um, because used cars tend to have more repairs that go along with them and it might become too intensive a use for that small of a property. 
staff recommendation is approval of PC620 subject to the conditions of approval found within the staff report. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and the applicant is here as well if you have any specific questions for them. Do we have any questions right now? I just had one. Was the previous um, list of um, uses very restrictive? Or, or I, I was just kind of, after I looked at the list, I mean, I thought that was pretty wide, why they wanted. I think, so I think the current owner obtained the properties around 2018, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and I think that they've just had a hard time finding someone to rent the property um, or potentially buy it. So from this them. is a newer owner than the previous Correct. times yes. this has come mm -hmm. forward. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor? Yes. So, so basically what we're saying here is we have slightly over a quarter of an acre, correct? Mm -hmm. And the guy couldn't find anybody that fit in the narrow range here, so we added a whole bunch of new ranges of possible uses in order to help him find somebody to buy his property. Essentially, yes. Um, and a lot of the uses since the previous ordinance, it was very restrictive. It could only be anything that you see listed on the screen. And so we kind of just, we went through our current ordinance and looked at the B1 allowed uses and then basically just gotcha. added to that. So that's gotcha. kind of how we came up with our proposed list. Does anyone have any questions for the applicant or would they like to just speak? They're not coming forward. <laughs> Mayor, good evening, members of the council. I'm sorry, I misheard. I th thought you were asking if anyone wanted to come forward, and I was comfortable just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, uh, What's next? And I, I missed the part where you said we invite the applicant up, so yeah. I apologize. I'm also just very grateful that all the police here tonight are for an award and not for me. <laughs> um, I have been to those kind of meetings before. <laughs> what an honor to have that award, though. I, uh, through some of my other work, are involved in accreditations, and I know the tremendous amount of work, the high standards that are set. I was very impressed to see that this evening. I hope you didn't mind me sharing just that personal thought. Sure. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, for your record, my name is Reese Anderson. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Pew and Lake, and my address is 1744 South Val Vista, number 217 in Mesa, Arizona. Pleasure to be with you this evening. So <clears throat> I don't have anything more really to add. The staff did an excellent job on this presentation. I would just maybe sharpen the point just a bit to answer a few of the questions, which is our client purchased the property in 2018 when he became aware of the limited uses that were there. We then started a conversation with the planning staff to see what was needed to be done to expand it to a fair use of, if you imagine that a piece of property was, had commercial uses on it since 85, zoned commercial since 95, and it's not necessary to rehash the, the history of what happened when. You just, you've got a commercial piece of property. You just want to have some fair uses on it, given its context within the city. Especially since we have the half exchange now at the freeway now. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So thinking now about that, we really worked on a balanced approach to make sure that appropriate uses were allowed. Uses that may cause troubles were, had a use permit, therefore, the city had the chance to look at it and evaluate things. And things that we knew were absolutely problematic or were opposed by citizens calling in, those are prohibited outright. So I think it's been a great balancing effort of all the parties here on this site. I don't want to belabor the point, Mayor, uh, but if you or any of the council members have questions, uh, please ask. I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for listening to Are me. there any questions? I have one. To your knowledge, as the owner of the property, has he been approached by somebody that could not rent this because of the list? Yes, so, and, and again, with the change in the zoning over the time, so the, uh, the, what started this, Councilman Schroeder, was a conversation that happened probably about a year ago where someone said, I'd, I'd just like to put a used car lot on this site. And so when they came down for a permit, thinking that there was no issue, 
then the staff said, hey, let's look at this old zoning ordinance. And so, uh, you know, a bit of embarrassment, but our client bought the property and did not check the zoning file. <laughs> so we, ha have we heard that story before? Yeah, we have. Yeah. We all have, right? Yeah. And it happens. The point, mm -hmm. though, is that mistake aside, now what do we do? What's a fair use of this site balanced again against all those things I talked about earlier? Long answer, but I hope that answers what the question. So other, other than that, um, there's been other people over time. I'm not privy to every conversation. I just know that the client, Mike Tadavosian, is asking us to say, look, I've got other inquiries, and so I'd just like to move forward with either him using it or someone else. But just a fair use is what we're asking. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. I'll have a seat. All right. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this item? George Schroeder, 244 West Virginia. We already have enough used car sales lots. The reason it was eliminated in the first place is because we don't want an overabundance uh, of property that's not being served uh, in, our, in our best interest. With all regard for the person, there's, obviously they want to use it in the best interest, the most money they can make. Who doesn't want that, right? It's America. But AJ is over inundated with too many of the same reflective, um, you know, source sites in our community. I think we're looking for more diversity other than restaurants and used car lots. <laughs> so please uh, consider that in your thoughts. Would anyone else like to speak? I'm uh, Jeff Barlett. I'm over at 108 North Meridian Drive in Apache Junction, Arizona. And the point I'd like to make is there's the point I'd like to make is that someone's trying to run a business, and I personally feel that we should protect our free market ideas here, and I think that if someone owns a property, they should be able to do what they want with it, and I feel that we should uh, have a free market system on helping this out, and thank you very much. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. As far as I know, everyone in here is driving a used car. So anyone else? Any questions? Okay, I'll ask for a motion. Whoa. Your Honor. Yes. I move that ordinance number 1496 be read by title only and the reading of the entire ordinance be waived. Second. Roll call. Council Member Barker? Yes. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. An ordinance of the mayor and the city council of the city of Apache Junction, Arizona, approving a planned development major amendment, case PZ-6-20, a request by Me Investment Group, Inc., represented by Reese Anderson and John Gillespie of Pew and Lake PLC, amending and expanding the palette of uses which can be allowed on the 0.28 acres general commercial by planned development B-1, PD, property repealing any conflicting provisions and providing for severability. Your Honor. Yes. I move that ordinance number 1496 is read by the city clerk be approved and adopted. Second. Roll call. Council member Evans? Yes. Council member Rizzi? Yes. Council member Struble? Yes. Council member Barker? Yes. Council member Schroeder? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes unanimously, Your Honor. Report, report on research conducted regarding the proposed United States flag at Flatiron Community mm -hmm. Park. Director Langenbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Good evening, uh, Mayor Surdy, members of the council, Parks and Recreation Director, Liz Langenbach here today. Let me get to my presentation real quick. Uh, there we go. Okay. At your September 1st meeting, um, you gave direction to us to research the installation, maintenance, as well as other considerations of installing uh, the largest flag in the state at Flatiron Community Park, as was um, brought up from community members that were interested in, the, in that endeavor. And so in the meantime, over this last month, we have discussed with the Parks and Recreation Commission, the Arts Commission, We've also conversed with the VFW Post 7968 and um, some of their membership about uh, what they were willing and, and interested in doing. Uh, we've reached out to several flag manufacturers and um, we also have some park staff who have had experience working at some of the car dealerships that have some of the larger flags. So we've definitely been able to look into a lot of different aspects of this uh, research project. So starting off with just some initial costs, I think um, everybody kind of is in that $80,000 to $110,000 ballpark um, of what the whole project would cost. Um, it really depends largely on the pole size that we end up, where it's located, some different things. So that's kind of why this range is a little bit varied. Um, the request was for a 50 foot by 80 foot flag and that is going to be required to be a weather resistant, very heavy duty um, caliber flag. And those were in the ballpark of anywhere from about uh, $6,000 on up to about $11,000 just for the flag itself. Uh, as we talk to different vendors um, and different locations where these, these flags have, have been, um, we were given the dimensions of either 160 foot on up to 240 foot. Uh, flagpoles. And some of those depend on, I think, some of the expectations that we'll talk later on about whether or not we'd be lowering it to half staff, um, different things like that. If you see on this image that I pulled from one of the sites, they kind of give you some general guidance on what your pole height should be based on your flag size. As you can see, 50 by 80 isn't even on their image. Um, but they do talk about that the length of the flag sh flagpole should be at least a quarter of the height of the pole. We've heard different numbers, so anywhere from a quarter of the length to a third of the length of the pole. Um, once, you know, if this was decided on to go forward, then those would just be things that uh, would be looked at a little bit more closely. Um, also in our research, if depending on the size of the flagpole, uh, will depend on how far, how much it has to be excavated, what the footprint of that um, pole and the footers are gonna be for um, securing something of that size. Most uh, places recommend that you would end up going beneath, uh, beneath the ground level at least 10% of the height of the flagpole. So a 240 foot flagpole would go down um, underneath 24 feet. Uh, and most all of them require kind of a footprint of approximately six foot by six foot square uh, for where uh, the footers and the concrete would be to, to stabilize it. Um, anything of this size would have to have structural engineered plans and you know that can range anywhere from 3,000 to about 5,000 is what it looked like from um, all the folks that we had talked to about this. Um, and then there would be obviously installation. Installation is kind of one of the biggest costs of the entire project as well as the site prep. Um, depending on you know, if things have to be moved in whatever location was chosen, if you, we have to bring other additional electricity for lighting, um, those kinds of different things. If we have to move any kind of uh, irrigation or anything at whatever different site might be looked at. And then finally, lighting. Um, a pole of this size does require, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but does require certain lighting. Um, oh, I'm sorry, a flag in general. If we're going to fly it, uh, if it's going to be flown, 24 seven, it has to be lit. That's the main consideration. We'll get into where there are some other lighting uh, requirements here in a few minutes. Um, so that was just the initial cost. The maintenance costs, uh, we are kind of estimating about $30,000 per year. Um, this would assume replacing the flag three times per year. So everybody we've talked to um, talks about 
that any flag, regardless of the size in our weather, in our wind, we typically replace a flag every three to six months. Uh, flag etiquette requires that it's a non-tattered flag. Um, our current flags that we use, we are replacing about uh, approximately that amount of times. Um, just depends on what the conditions are throughout the year. Um, so we kind of, instead of saying four times or two times a year, we just pick something in the middle. So if we had to do it three times a year um, at, you know, anywhere between $8,000 or so per flag, in addition to the flag being replaced, um, there just will be some other incidentals for lighting, electrical, accessory types of things that have to be replaced. So $30,000 was the approximate cost of the maintenance annually. Next, um, one of the things you guys had mentioned at the meeting and as we talked through this was just lighting, uh, making sure that we considered all the factors that would be needed uh, to be considered. Uh, one of the vendors that we researched, we actually grabbed this from their website. Carrot Top Industries is one of the uh, flag manufacturing companies that we've worked with in the past. They showed examples of three different lighting techniques. Um, they all have various pros and cons. So this one is above ground beam, so it's basically something that's outside of, you know, a, a little uh, contraption that sits on top of the ground, and it pretty much um, shines a light just in this general area. And as you can see, it's pretty dark everywhere else that it's not shining. The other one is the um, ball top light. So that is, oh, I have a misspelling there. I'm sorry. Dang it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this type here certainly lights the top of the flag. It definitely ha it might need to be that at the top of it for some of our FAA requirements. There's some different reasons why that might be the case. But as you can see, it's pretty bright once it's on the top. And so that um, could be some concerns for uh, some of our more dark sky friendly types of applications, but there are a lot of um, different manufacturers and different folks that can uh, look into some of those things. And then the last application was in ground. If you go out tonight, you'll see that our flags that are out front have an in ground, it's flush with the ground, and it um, pretty much just goes up the, the shape of the pole. For a 240 foot pole, um, I'm sure that that's a pretty big light. And so again, some of the things that we were able to determine really until we get down to the basics of where it's at and what it's going to be, it was a little bit difficult finding some very specific information for all of you. And those would be things that would need to receive some further consideration. Um, as I stated be be before, the Federal AD Aviation Administration, they do require permitting of anything that is over 200 feet. So if we were to go to the 240 foot pole, we would have to go through them um, for permitting as well as lighting of the structure at the top. Um, and there are various applications for that. I do think that those are things we would consider, you know, without knowing, and I know we'll talk about that tonight too, without knowing what our specific uh, rules are with a dark sky ordinance. Um, those are just some things that would be of concern. Uh, as we looked at friendly pole lighting for, or I'm sorry, friend, dark sky friendly pole lighting, the largest uh, flag that I found so far was the 20 foot by 30 foot. A lot of the poles are in locations that either don't, may, might not have that ordinance, or they might be along, for example, the, um, the car dealerships are already along a very well-lit uh, freeway system, and so they don't have quite the same, they have some exemptions for the dark sky lighting. So that would be something that we would need to have further consideration. Location, I know it was um, proposed as a location for Flatiron Community Park, and so I just put a few locations in here. As we began, began this conversation, and as uh, we listened to our Parks and Rec Commission members, our Arts Commission, we did have a, a member from the public reached out to us through email. Um, we just had a lot of, heard a lot of concerns about Flatiron itself. I think everybody's agreeable that we, we love this park. It's in the downtown area. We really want to have, it would be neat to have something like that there. There are just some challenges. Um, so kind of just to talk through what some of the things that we would need to consider here. Um, in order to have the footing and to be able to put something that size and the clearance that we would have to have, really the only place that has that space that isn't in the grass is kind of in this far corner here that currently the master plan calls for a large ramada. And so um, not that it's out of the question, but we'd have to go back and uh, relook at the council would, if that was a 
a location that was determined um, that it needed to be, then we'd have to relook at the master plan for that, decide do we not want to have that ramada. That is a future addition. Um, this event right here is actually the um, veterans tribute on the weekend of the uh, veterans and FOTS. And so having a ramada in this area is kind of a very desirable thing. And so trying to figure out where we would put that, I think, is the biggest challenge. Additionally, uh, think water is uh, this section. We have an easement there right now that we entered into in order to receive the funding from AJ Water. And so there are things that are in perpetuity, if I said that right, uh, that are located here. So again, we just would really have to really consider where it would fit. The other part that we talked about with our um, Public Works Director, Mike Weaver, I'd asked if he could give me some, if we had any kinds of uh, restrictions as we are near to a road to have that type of uh, flag that, you know, could very easily be, you know, blowing pretty widely. You know, are there any height restrictions we had to consider, anything like that? And he um, basically said that it would really just depend on where it's located, and that would be the case for many of these other sites as well. Um, he recommends about a 90-foot radius clearance from the base of it because of the way that an 80-foot flag would stretch out, potentially be in that view um, of traffic. It seems like it's up so high, but I think it, again, just really depends on what that pole is designed like. 90-foot radius was something out, so like in this vicinity and this size. And so it just really, the site is so small, um, it really, ends up being kind of a challenging location for it. Um, so we just wanted to put out some other ideas so, so as the group considers. I know today is just a research phase and um, I think we'll, I don't know if we'll have further direction after this, but Veterans Memorial Park, this is on the corner of Superstition and Idaho. Um, this was actually another project that was brought to us by the veteran community. Uh, back in 1982, we cooperated with uh, the veterans organizations at that time, they helped to raise all the money for it. They planned it. They had weekly meetings for several uh, years leading up to the event, uh, up to this. And um, this is actually a pretty big chunk of land. It's less utilized now because of Flatiron. We don't have our concerts and as many things here, but they have weddings. Um, they have, we have had some other activities out here. It could be a really great location. It's still very close to the downtown area. Um, so that's one thought. In addition, it, it's another, you know, this, uh, they redid a lot of the um, plaques and things that were there honoring the veterans. But it's been many years. I think it's been almost 20 years since the, re, the facelift happened. And, it, you know, it really could use another facelift. So having, you know, this be a site of a, a better, a bigger project is, is a neat idea. The other location, Prospector Park, has lots of room. So there's lots of different places that you could consider. Prospector Park is utilized on a regular basis for many, many activities. It's probably our most um, popular park. It has the most use and a lot of events out there. So it's another um, idea. I think it's more in a dark skies area, though. So again, lighting is a, is a consideration. Um, and so we just would want to make sure that we uh, knew that we'd have to go back to the drawing board with the group or with council to really reconsider the locations if this was moved further. Um, some of the final considerations, again, just through the notes from your previous meeting as well as the meetings uh, that we held since, we did look into the liability of could there be some major concerns. It's, it really is a low risk once it's installed, um, once it's there, as long as it's structurally engineered, you know, we probably would have low risk in that. Um, the funding, I know, was something that was brought up quite a bit. You know, as we talked with Danny Green, she re, um, manages um, many aspects of the VFW post 7968 that is um, located over by the Chamber of Commerce. And um, so we had a, a lot of conversations with her about, um, you know, what the veterans were interested in and what was the interest. She had reached out because I think the community member and the mayor had uh, talked with her about them po possibly being the financial pass-through. So their organization would be the one that would accept the donation. So it was coming through a um, 501c3. Uh, it would be subject to transparency and all those kinds of good things. And so she had called us to let us know that that was something that they were 
uh, willing to do. And we talked with her a lot about, you know, just some of the concerns that had been uh, shared and then with some of the questions that we had. And I think that at that time, and that was a couple of weeks ago, they had raised, I, I want to say $15,000. It might have been ten, some, maybe $10,000. And she felt that they, you know, I, she came up with the same numbers that we did, that it's in that anywhere from 80000 to almost 120000 I think she had mentioned at one time. Um, and additionally, she had indicated that the group, as they talked about this, that they definitely did not, they did not want the burden of the cost to fall on the city, including the maintenance each year. And so I know that was something that was a concern. It's always a concern of ours. Um, just because we do have limited funds and there's lots of projects every year that we're not funding. Um, and so just thinking of adding new ones is, is tough for us. Uh, while we think it's a wonderful project, that's always a tough thing for us to consider. Um, we talked with her also about half staff and other considerations. So, you know, again, we, we started to be concerned, what does it mean to put a flag that size to half staff? And, you know, it, it would come with the mechanisms to make it so that you could um, easily do that. But that would be something that we would definitely want to bring back and talk more about um, just because it, it does limit some of the other things that can be done. It limits where it can be. If it's at half staff, it definitely makes it so that you have to go with a larger poll. Those would be things that we'd want to make sure that we consider more fully as we move along, as well as anything else that needs um, that the veterans feel are uh, things that we should be concerned of. And then finally, I, I put this here as something for us all to consider. You know, in my time with the Parks and Recreation Department, and as I look through the history of a lot of our wonderful projects, they, use, they come to us, many of them, as volunteer projects or as community-driven projects. And the members at that time are always wanting and desirous of not adding a, a fin another financial burden to the city. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that over time, 10 years go by or 15 years go by, and the people who were having those conversations aren't there anymore. Um, the military flags that are at the marquee right now are a, a good example of, you know, when that was decided on, that was another veterans project um, brought about to replace the Trail of Flags, which was a veterans project that was uh, created on Apache Trail. And just over time, the people that talked about, well, the veterans group will always replace the flags. You know, our director isn't, you know, our former director is no longer with us and I'm there. Over time, we just start paying for certain things. And so I think we just definitely want to make sure something of this size and as we move forward, I would, um, would just recommend that we think about how we can uh, solidify those commitments um, somehow. And I'm sure it's not 100% possible, but you know, it's something that I think I would be responsible for us to consider moving forward. That's everything that I have. I'm happy to answer any of your questions, and then I, we can talk about next steps or if there are other steps. So we will talk about next step in a little bit. I think with a heavy duty enough flag, three months is ridiculous to have to replace it. I think, you know, that's gonna be important, the quality of flag so that they don't have to be replaced. I was hoping on once a year or even more so. so as we reached out to some of those larger companies they all are replacing their flag or taking one down and putting another one up and taking it and to a seamstress and then they those will larger companies make money that way too no I'm, I'm sorry I mean the companies that are flying the flag not uh, so for example the um, auto dealership some of those different places they are they are replacing them um, at least a couple times a year if not more just depending on the wind Okay. Do we have an <clears throat> do we have an estimated cost on what it is <clears throat> you mentioned repairing? So um, our parks maintenance supervisor Dave Butler he actually worked for one of the dealerships and it was his job to take it down and drop it off at the seamstress. He recalls the price being uh, and their flag was smaller than this, but not I mean it was still it's still one of the biggest flags out there. Um, it was like about a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars at that time. I think he worked for them about ten years ago. So. Um, I can't imagine it's too much different than that, but a couple thousand dollars probably to uh, repair it. So you'd need to buy two, and you'd have one. Mm -hmm. um, they can repair it a certain amount of times until it can't be sewn anymore, I believe. Um, but that's certainly an option that can be looked at. Okay. Just and I, 
And I believe there's over 15,000 for sure. From cool. all, yeah. Okay. Just, uh, this is kind of a question. That size of a flag, how much wind would it take to get it to blow? Is there any? So I don't know what the exact thing is, but the, that's what the engineering um, report. So I, you know, as we think about that, the whole engineering stamping, it seems like it's not a big deal. But I, uh, Larry Kirch actually gave me one that was an example of one from another state for an 150 foot tall pole that has a 40 foot by 80 foot flag, which is so strange that the dimensions are different. So I don't know what that's about. And maybe it wasn't a US flag, it could have been something else. This one had a six foot square um, footer that was 15 foot deep, but this is the packet that, and it is like all kinds of little dimensions and wind things. So I don't know what it is, but it's, they would be basically making, ensuring that whatever we put it in could withstand that and wouldn't do anything uh, to it. And that's what those dimensions are about in here. Well, I guess my question is, would, I mean, that size of a flag, I'm, I'm, you know, otherwise it's just going to hang, hung. The, the flag is just going to be. Mm, I see. Most days it's just going to be hanging there. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get that. But I don't know. If at, at what point? Do, I mean, what is it? A thirty know. mile an hour wind that gets it to blow so that people can see it out there? Do we have any idea of that, or is it? I don't. Tune? It's going to depend so on the flag. This is not the best example, but um, this flag is the largest in the United States right now. This was like the 400 foot flag um, or 400 foot pole. I honestly, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know what size the flag was. But for the most part, I mean, it, it blows, it, things can make it blow in the wind and I don't know how windy it is here, but <laughs> yeah. no, just, that's a good question. I guess I didn't really consider that. Yeah, uh, it's it's going to depend on the quality of the flag, right? So if it's a light flag, so I, yeah, we don't know. But the heaviness of it makes a difference. But that I'm could just, be another thing to consider. As just we, asking. I'm yeah. just wondering if there was something. Just out of curiosity, I, I don't expect that you would know this, but maybe for the future, do we have any idea what size the pole is at the chamber currently? We've used that for the FOTS and the veterans celebration, and I'm just totally curious at, to know. At the, um, so the flagpole at Flatiron that we put up just during FOTS, and I don't know if it's the same size as the, as the did you say it, the chamber? The chamber has a Yeah, size. so ours is 30 foot that we have right now, mm -hmm. or that is at, um, and I'm not sure what the ones at the marquee are, but they're in that 30 foot to, um, or so range. I'd be curious to know what the, what size it is at the chamber. Just to visually compare what. Okay. For transparency reasons, we did, several of us had a meeting with VFW and some contractors and they have some of the same conclusions and uh, they think that they could get it done w at a cost savings, which benefits everyone, which get, then gives more money for the maintenance. Uh, they also took into consideration the uh, ADA uh, possibilities of if it is a structure, does it have to be accessible if there's a platform mm. to get a wheelchair up there? And when you think of the, uh, the veterans that would want to come to look at this, a lot of them are possibly handicapped. So we think we want to uh, incorporate that into it for sure. Yeah, I think that that's another great consideration as we consider if this was to move forward, if you were to consider location, same as if somebody wants to take a photo at, at it. You know, we tried to kind of think about how we could show it to scale and it was hard. You'd want to really look to see if you're taking a photo, you know, how far away you'd have to be to be able to get the person in the photo and that size of a flagpole. Um, and then where is the best location for something like that? That was another thing that was brought up at our parks, at, at both commission meetings that uh, we should just make sure that we're considering. And one of the, uh, of course, electricity is a big uh, issue and they've come up with that it would need to have a chain driven, you know, motor mm -hmm. that you would uh, access and turn it on and, yeah. and run it up and down. That way you wouldn't want to be hand cranking that. Correct. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So there was a lot of different types of apparatuses to make that usable. Chip or Robin, or Chip or Robert, do you have anything else to add? So yeah. the next step, we need to get these contractors to compare notes with you and see uh, 
it's, you, I mean, just to explore more possibilities, pro and con, and then uh, move forward from then. And then yeah. So are you talking about the VFW picking the contractors or city staff working on the contractors? Since they're donating the money, I think if they would come up with a contractor and engineer, I think that would be yeah. reasonable to, to do. So um, just to clarify then, so it sounds like maybe we're looking for some more information before we... Well, I would like maybe... To okay, thank that. you. So we've done direction to staff. We've, re we've received re direction to staff. We presented the direction, which is to, prov to go do some research and provide data on, on this. If we were to move forward, I would like to seek direction to staff on what to do next. And also, there's a little bit of precedent with the Kachina, which was presented the same way, but you couldn't just take someone's word that it's gonna get up properly. So the city had to you know, double check and have a structural engineer make sure that it was gonna be safe. And I would expect the same thing would happen if, if we did get, if they did come up with their own contractors, you'd wanna you know, check out and uh, possibly get a second opinion on structure. And in talking with the um, Feldman Services, uh, Director Kirch did share that there isn't a permit for a flag, but having stamped structural engineer plans and that it's going to be installed per the plans, that would be what, would, what we would be looking for. Mm -hmm. So as of today, should we just let this, leave it off of an agenda until there's more discussion among with uh, we can put it on another agenda at a future point is what typically happens. It, from my perspective, I don't, I don't know what you all exactly want to do. The, the data now has been presented. It, it can be yeah. you know, well, reviewed with the committee. I think that something this big is, it needs to be kind of some committee. I don't know who the committee is that's doing this. And One of the obstacles that I saw was that if it would go to Flatiron, the, the plans for the Ramada, and how big of an obstacle would that be? Well, because this is citizen driven and they're raising the money, should we just set like a dollar amount whenever they have 50% of the estimated cost mm -hmm. or 75% of the cost to then bring it back as we're closer to finality of it? And then they would be able to have their contractors. I don't. Think so because if it's not going to happen, they're not going to want to raise, continue raising money. Because they haven't even officially started raising money yet. Once they get the go ahead, then they could start fundraising in earnest. And I'm not sure if this is accurate still, but a couple weeks ago when I talked with um, Danny Green, she had said that they stopped really um, advertising, collecting the money mm -hmm. until they could. They, she, again, I think. My feeling from her was that she was very respectful of, and they are very respectful of, that this is something that really needs to be considered and determined if it's doable, um, and that they didn't want to keep asking people, you know, they didn't want people to put in money and then have to give that back kind of thing. I mean, they, they have a recording of what they have now, but they kind of wanted to wait until they knew. So they want like an acceptance letter from the city that we're willing to take it, or they kind of... I, I don't, I don't, know, what I don't know what the next step would be, mm -hmm. to be I, I honest. I think it was more in the aspect of coming forward with um, a, a presentation by the group as to, you know, a solid... We want to sign. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to achieve it and, and have different things set up so that uh, it can be, I say, looked at by the city to see it meets all the requirements. So then I'm just throwing this out there then as a potential direction. If you want us to have a direction, can we do a direction to the staff tonight? We can't. So we'd have to come to another meeting so yeah, to do I a think, direction yeah, to right, staff. So they can tell me to put on a future council to talk about. I think part of the idea is like in that process that we've done and used since 85 was to allow for this data to simmer in the community and go talk about it. And I would think you'd want to be a part of any type of discussion. Yes, list. absolutely. And that we could be involved in that and being able to talk about some of this and then at some point by some air bring it back when you want us to bring it back to talk about to get for future direction mm -hmm. so and, and do we know is this just the one VFW post or are both VFWs 
in Boston. Back to the six. Yeah, so my understanding was that it was, I only talked to the one representative, just so you know, but my understanding was that it was several of the veterans organizations that were um, involved in that. Yeah. The question I have is at what stage do we start um, getting serious about location? Because that's going to impact size <laughs> and other things, like you mm -hmm. said, the lighting. It's greatly going to impact the cost. Um, it may, you know, we, we already determined that it's probably not going to happen at Flatiron. It's, that's what it's sounding like. You know, you, you see what I mean? Right. At what point do we start saying, okay, let's narrow down the location in order to go forward? I don't see why it can't happen at Flatiron. I mean, you know, what would be thing. interesting yeah. is to have the analysis done, like what could be done at Flatiron or what yeah. could be done right. and the cost associated with each of those because there could be some sentiment out there about yeah. it may be worth trying because I don't know what the, ex the cost as it goes down in size. It could really significantly change the, the cost too as well depending on. Or the on location. Or the location, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That was kind of what I meant. <laughs> okay. So we're just at that initial brainstorming part and now I think we can go start to have more brainstorms. We, we, we can do that and then when time is ready and you hear you're ready, we'll put it on an agenda and talk about it some more. Okay. Okay, so we'll leave it hanging like that then and we'll uh, get it on a future agenda. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you guys want to take a break after this or before we start? Probably before. <laughs> okay. Break now. Okay, we're going to take a five minute recess.
I'm going to call the meeting back into order. And then I want to make a couple statements before we get started. These will all be individual motions, not one large motion. Uh, as we went through the applications last night, a couple of people got slighted because the first three people that we looked at had uh, applied for different positions and we only interviewed them, I, I believe for library, but they were also interested in the other boards. Then as we got further into it, we started talking to every, every candidate on all the other boards. So, so Daryl Cross and Dirk Begeman and Frank Shanebeck didn't really get to, uh, talk, to uh, talk about being on PNZ. So I just wanted to uh, let council know about that. And also this is my 12th or th actually 13th year up here because we got that extra year when they unified the elections. Mm -hmm. And I've always been disappointed with how quickly this goes. And, and it's such, so frantic and in a hurry. So I'm gonna deliberately slow this process down. And after every motion, I'm gonna take like a 30 second pause to have everybody get their notes together just so that we're, uh, we know exactly what we're doing because these are important, uh, important assets to the city. So Jennifer, do you need to say anything or just go right into it? You've covered it all, Mayor. Thank you very much. You're and I'm go going to do them in this order. I'm gonna do planning and zoning first, then board of adjustment, then the library board, then parks and recreation, and then the public retirement board. Yes. Your Honor, can I add something? Um, I just wanted to say to the applicants, first of all, thank you. Um, I think this is the first time since I've been on the council that we've had this many uh, applicants. So this is really great. There have been many years where <laughs> people had to um, volunteer out of the audience because we didn't have enough people to fill the position. So we're really grateful and appreciative of all the people that are stepping up and, and getting involved. Um, if you don't get selected, don't take it personal. Um, it's 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 just sometimes other people have different backgrounds and whatnot and might be a better fit. And, and if you don't get selected for a certain uh, board, keep trying. Um, there's positions that come open, things change. So don't just automatically give up, keep trying. Some of us have tried several times to get on some. Um, there are some boards that would, um, are probably a better fit if you've been in the community a little bit longer and, and have a little bit of better understanding of some things. Uh, or if you've even taken the Citizens Leadership Academy over some that, you know, the Citizens Leadership may not necessarily impact that. So, so um, thank you for everybody and, and don't give up if you don't get what you were uh, applying for. Okay, with that, I believe Vice Mayor Wilson wanted to make the first motion on planning and zoning. Yes, <clears throat> Your Honor, I'd like to nominate Daryl Cross for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Is second. there a second? Second. Okay, roll call. Council Member Strubel? Yes. Council Member Evans? No, I had someone else in mind. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Here. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. Your Honor. Oh. Yeah. You're, is your okay, Robin's going to be up in about 10 seconds. Yeah. 10 seconds, 9, 8, yeah. 7, 6. Oh. Your Honor, if yes, I may. Yes, Robin. <laughs> do, do we need it? If I may. Yes. The motion, make sure to include the term Absolutely. because we do oh, have, yes. they expire at different okay. times. Uh -huh. But since this was the first motion, I assumed it was the 2023 okay. expiration date. Robin. Um, I move that Jesse Gage be appointed to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a term to expire on October 31, 2023. Second. Roll call. Council Member Strubel? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? I had somebody else in mind, no. Council Member Schroeder? I do had someone else in mind, no. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson. <laughs> and there are a total of four There's to be four appointed, positions right? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yes. 
Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. Your Honor, is the time up? Almost. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, Council Member Struble. <laughs> I'm just, um, I'd like to nominate Peter Heck to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. So we will have one more, and that will be, that board will be filled. But what, which yeah. term With a different is different date, yeah. It'll be the, yeah. the last term, is that what we're looking yeah. at? Yes. Which, yeah, okay. the last, there were four to be, a, to four positions open, so. Okay. I'll ask for a motion on that last one. Your Honor, I move that Frank Shaneback be appointed to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a term to expire on October 31st, 2021. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? I had somebody else, no. Council Member Schroeder? <laughs> no. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? He's currently on Board of Adjustment. Yeah, I guess he was too. Yeah, he's put the term he for on board. His term's up mm -hmm. on the Board of Adjustment? Mm -hmm. No. No. Oh, that's right. I'm going to say no. Mayor Surdy. Okay, I don't usually have to make crucial decisions like this, but I'm looking at someone else too, so I'm gonna say no as well. Sorry, Frank. Your Honor. Motion fails, we'll need another motion. Krista? Um, Your Honor, I would like to nominate uh, Dirk Fegeman for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Is there a second? <laughs> I'll second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? No. Council Member Evans? No. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. <coughs> Council Member Barker? No. Vice Mayor Wilson? No, I'm going to say yes because he was mine. Uh, Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor, four to three. Okay, now, Jennifer, we have now disrupted the Board of Adjustment, so a Effective right now, Jesse Gage is off of that board, correct? correct. And his term was up. <clears throat> 2021. Yes. Oh, that's right. And Dirk Begeman's term was up in 2022. So we have, instead of the three, we now have five people. That is correct. Okay, thank you. And we're going to do that board next. And I'm going to ask for a motion. Your Honor. Your Honor. Oops. I've got Krista first. Um, I would move to uh, place Joe Derbala on the Board of Adjustments. Second. Which which term, Krista? Oh. Oops. Uh, oh, they're all going. No, they won't be the same. For the longest it's, term. It's I all here. <laughs> well, they oh. all end but, October okay, 31. So for, 2023. No, because the two that we're replacing, mm -hmm. one's in 21 and the other one's in 22. And the three? And then three will be 23. Mm -hmm. For the longest term. <laughs> For October 31st, October 2023. 31st, 2023. <laughs> Got it. Second. Roll call. Oh, I, I, I had Vice Mayor Wilson at the second? Yep. Yes. Okay. Council Member Struble. Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Ma uh, Vice Mayor yes. Wilson? Yes. <laughs> Mayor Surdy? <laughs> yes. Unanimous, Your Honor? Your so Honor? there are four more to go there, mm -hmm. so I will ask for another motion. Your Honor? 
Yes. I move that Sean O'Hara be reappointed to the Board of Adjustments for a term to expire on October 31st, 2023. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Unanimous, Your Honor. That's three. We have two more to do, and they have the same terms? No. Two. That was two. We only have two. We've, We've only have two. Okay, so this is number three, mm -hmm. and I'll ask for a motion for that one. Your Honor? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I move that Luciano Buzzin yeah. be reappointed to the Board of Adjustments for the term to expire on October 31st, 2023. Second. Council Member Struble? No. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Unanimous, uh, sorry, motion passes, Your Honor. Now we have two more, and are they till 2023 or are these to 2021? One more. The next motion, if you like, will be to uh, replace Jesse Gage. His term expires 1031 of 2021. Okay, I'm gonna ask for a motion for that one. Your Honor. Robert. I move that Caitlin Knox be appointed Board of Adjustments for the term of 2021. Is there a second? I will go ahead and second that. Council Member Struble? No. Council Member Evans? Mm, no. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? No. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes four to three, Your Honor. We have one more, and this is a shorter term, correct? Yes, 22. Correct, it'll expire in 2022. Okay, and everyone's made a motion so far, so I'll ask for a motion from someone. I'm trying to figure out who else applied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we definitely did not have that many apply for that board, so my recommendation would be someone with P and Z aspirations because it ties so closely to that board. Yeah. Mayor? Yes, Jeff. I'd like to nominate, I've got to get the right first name here, <clears throat> Mr. Ozaki to the terms of the, is that Carl? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes Carl. Second. 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 And we have a roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Mm -hmm. Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Um, I, he expressly said he didn't, wasn't interested in any of the board, boards, so I would, I'm gonna say no. Okay. Council Member Barker? I didn't hear that. I'm gonna say yes because I didn't hear him say that. Was he here? Was he Vice Mayor Wilson? Uh, I'm gonna say yes because uh, it'd be a stepping stone for him, mm -hmm. even though he expressed. Yeah, he wanted P and, P, P and Z. Yes. Mayor Surdy? I'm gonna say yes, because he'll grow to love it. Okay, motion passes, Your Honor. Yeah. We have eight minutes. Okay, two down, three more to go. We're gonna move on to the library board, and there's four appointments there. Well, you messed me up on this one, because I had Dirk on this one, and you guys took him and put him on P&Z, and... It, yeah, <laughs> right. it's, that's what's taking <laughs> so long. Just, yeah, yeah. No, but I will make a motion. Oh. Okay. I move that Pam Krause be appointed to the library board for a term to expire on October 31, 2023. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Unanimous, Your Honor, motion passes. 
Your Honor. Yeah. Okay. You ready? I am Can't still check. trying to get us to take our time. So, <laughs> yes, I'm ready, Gail. Oh, I feel like a pregnant pause. <laughs> <laughs> um, I move that Vivian Radsky be appointed to the Library Board for a term to expire on October 31st, 2023. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble. Yes. Council Member Evans. Yes. Council Member Rizzi. No. Council Member Schroeder. Yes. Council Member Barker. Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes. Mayor Surdy. Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. So that was two down. We have two more to go. Correct. And Your Honor. Yep. I will ask for a motion from Krista. <laughs> um, I move that Jeff Bartlett be appointed to the library board. Is there a second? So, well, for which term? For which term? For 2022. Let me get back over there. I'd the last two appointments are fulfilling vacant positions and they will both expire on 2022. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Waiting for a second. Oh, Did I get a second. I lost track of what okay. was going roll, on there. <laughs> roll call. Okay. Council Member Struble. Yes. Council Member Evans. Um, no. Council Member Rizzi. Yes. Council Member Schroeder. Yes. Council Member Barker. Oh, I'm sorry. I had somebody else in mind. No. Okay. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes. Mayor Surdy. Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. Then we have one position left, and this is from uh, Mr. Willie Howard's position, who was awesome for the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your He's Honor. very well missed. Yeah. So I'll ask for a motion. Yeah. Your Honor. Robin. Okay, I move that Lori Wine be appointed to the library board for a term to expire October 31, 2022. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes. Mayor Surdy. Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. So that fills the library board. So we're going to move on to two positions on parks and recreation. And I will ask for a motion on that. Your Honor. Yes. I move that uh, Jesse Gage be reappointed to uh, the parks and recreation board for a uh, position in what, 2023 is theirs? Yes. Oh, just put them on the front again. Hang on. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. It's like two big boards. Yeah. Oh. He's very active on sewer as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it looks like there's not going to be a second on that. Okay. So I'll ask for another motion. Your, Your Honor. Honor. Robert. Um, this is for 2023, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. They both are. Um, Pardon me if I massacre the name here. Diley Kyan? <laughs> DL. DL? DL. Second. <laughs> Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. We have one position left here, and that's also 2023. Yep. Yes. I'm going to ask for a motion. Uh -huh. Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, recommend uh, or nominate Judy Boyer for uh, her, her position in 2023. Second. Yep. And I believe you meant Bory. Bory. Yes. Okay. Roll call. I can't Council read in writing. <laughs> Council Member Struble. <laughs> yes. Council Member Evans. Yes. Council Member Rizzi. Yes. Council Member Schroeder. Yes. Council Member Barker. Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes. Mayor Surdy. Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. We have one board left, Public Safety Retirement Board. 
and I believe Chair Onyx? Robin Barker has asked to nominate here. Okay, I move that Jaime Lanza be appointed to the Public Safety Personnel Retirement Board for a, a term to expire on October 31, 2022. I'll second it. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. <laughs> Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. And one last position for public safety personnel, and I'll ask for a motion. Your Honor? Yes. I move that C.E. Beal be appointed to the Public Safety Personnel Retirement Board for a term to expire on October 31st, 2024. Second. Roll call. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you for everybody taking your time on that and not rushing through it. So I felt better about it. Presentation, discussion, consideration of resolution 2035, approving a submittal for an application to the Gila River Indian Community Shared Revenue Problem, or program, not problem. <laughs> Chief <laughs> Kelly. Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, City Council, and uh, staff. So as you're aware, the Gila River Indian Community, um, under proper, proper Proposition 202, uh, has a state shared program. Under that program, back in April, we had uh, requested a grant from them to purchase some uh, handheld radios. With that, uh, they what they did is they changed a the procedure where in the past you had to do a resolution prior to making an application of the grant, and currently now they're asking a resolution after you receive a grant, which should make an easy resolution for you to agree to, <laughs> <coughs> which means that you're gonna get $96,000 to purchase police radios, which we direly need. So with that, I would ask you to accept and accept the uh, proposal and uh, do the resolution. Is there any discussion? or questions. I don't see any. I think this is uh, yeah, uh, do you, how many wrote how much does that how many how, pe how many pieces of equipment does that give us? Hmm. Um, about 10. Wow. Just want to let that out there that those yeah, those there, radios, the, yeah. the handheld radios run around $8,000 per radio. Yeah. And the hard mount run uh, hard mount radios which go in the car are about the same thing to about $10,000. Yeah. And how often do we have to replace those? <laughs> well, the, the reason it's become a kind of a critical situation for us is the current ones we have are outdated and Motorola no longer makes parts for them and they also don't service them and are, we don't have a contract with them anymore because they don't make the parts for them. So currently the radios are still functioning. Um, so that's good, uh, but when they break then it's useless. So. That's why we've been doing these grants for a while. So we've been very um, um, blessed with the fact that the reservation, the Native American community has been very supportive of us, especially in this, this case okay. here. So. And do you anticipate, I mean, the, uh, the casinos took a big hit from COVID. Do you look at revenues to come down on what they all will be sharing? It's really hard to tell. I mean, in the past, um, we, we've been actually had some uh, luck with some of the casinos recently. Uh, we had Homeland Security gave us a grant, and then uh, you'll be looking at another one co probably come to you from another um, tribal community in the upcoming um, thing next. Soon as next we can get it to you. Yeah. So yeah. it's from Mok Chen. Yeah. <clears throat> so so far so good on that. We don't know what the impact will be a couple years from now. Yeah. And in the past, in the past, we really were passed over. We didn't get any recognition or any uh, grants. But the grants have really diminished down, so it's hard for us to guess. I mean, in all reality, the amount of the money that we need or the city needs to buy these radios is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And these little little amounts, so ninety-nine, ninety-six thousand dollars, is a lot of money, but it really replaces very few radios. 
Okay. All right, I will uh, ask for a motion. Your Honor? Yes. I move that resolution number 20-35, a resolution of the mayor and the city council of the city of Apache Junction, approving the submittal of proposition 202, an emergency, place, uh, police communications equipment grant application to the Gila River Indian community be approved. Second. Roll call. <laughs> Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Is that an answer to my? Council Member Evans? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Council Member Barker? Yes. Yeah. Council Member Strubel? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Mayor Sturdy? Yes. Unanimous, Your Honor. Presentation update, possible additional direction to staff on the application for the nomination of the City of Apache Junction as an international dark sky community. And do I go to Robert on that? Or? It, no. no, we're ready to provide a presentation on the update from staff. Dr. Kelsey. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Kelsey Shatnick. I'm a planner on staff. Um, and tonight I have an update on possibly designating Apache Junction as an international dark sky community. So back in March, um, staff was directed to investigate and come back with changes to be made, potential costs to the city as well as citizens in becoming a dark sky community. For those of, uh, in the audience who might not know what an international dark sky community is, um, an IDA international dark sky community is a town, city, municipality, or other legally organized community that has shown exceptional dedication to the preservation of the night sky through the implementation and enforcement of a quality outdoor light, lighting ordinance, dark sky education, and citizen support of dark skies. So what would it take to update our zoning ordinance? Well, within uh, over the past few months, staff has been working to um, look at our current outdoor lighting ordinance and see what changes would need to be made in order to be compliant with the minimum requirements of a dark sky community. Some of those changes would include um, having illuminated signs be turned off at 10 p.m. or one hour after business close, whichever is later, having a lumen cap in non-residential and multifamily zoning districts in order to prevent overlighting, having light fixtures over 1,000 initial lamp lumens um, required to be fully shielded, and have a maximum color correlated temperature of 3,000 kelvins, and essentially with the Kelvins, um, that just means it's gonna be more of an amber tone light instead of a cool blue tone. Um, this is especially important for wildlife at night. Um, the blue tone can kind of be harmful, so that's kind of why that is a part of the requirements. In terms of what it would cost to an individual, um, basically, so on the left-hand side, you can see kind of it's um, a good depiction of what is not acceptable versus what is acceptable. Um, a lot of the, so in order to be shielded, you cannot see the light source. Um, so it kind of depends on what fixture you choose. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see two examples that I found on a, um, on a hardware store site. The IDA provides a whole list and links online to um, different fixtures that are dark sky compliant to make it easy to find. These two specific lights have a 60 watt maximum um, in terms of the light bulb that you can place into it. They're approximately $40 for each fixture, not taking into account the cost of the light bulb. And this, the product feature for both of these fixtures um, actually indicates that it is dark sky compatible. So it is fairly easy to be able to determine whether or not the fixture you're choosing will meet, um, will be in compliance. So what does a dark sky community look like? So as part of our research, um, a few staff members, including myself, went out to Fountain Hills and observed it at night. Um, it's a designated international dark sky community, and so we thought it would be a good idea to see what that really looks like. Um, the picture on the left-hand side is of an apartment complex. Um, you can see that it is not overlit, but it, you can clearly identify where it is um, and be able to walk around. And on the right-hand side is a bus stop. Again, you can see that it's not overlit and the light is shining down and not spilling 
um, very far past the stop itself. The next picture, um, this kind of shows you different signage and what that looks like. Um, as you can see the, on the picture on the left, there is actually, or not see, there is a sign um, in between the nails and Euro Pizza. Um, but since that business is not open at that time, it has been turned off um, if it was even installed with lights to begin with. Um, the signage has to be turned off by 10 p.m., like I said earlier, or at business close. This is another good example of signage. This is the same target. Um, the left-hand side is when it is open, and on the right-hand side, it is after it's been closed. Um, I took that picture, and that was when employees were leaving the store and going home for the evening. And then this is at Fountain Park. On the left-hand side, you can see that there are plenty of um, bollards lining the path, but you can still clearly see where you're going, um, but everything is shielded downward and not um, kind of spilling over into the grassy areas. And then the picture on the right is taken from the park looking at a commercial strip center that has a few restaurants. Um, this was taken about 8 o'clock at night. So things were open. There were many people outside. There was a live band. Um, but you can still see that it is very dark and the light is contained to the space. In addition to um, figuring out what it might cost for an individual, we also discussed with Public Works what it would take to get all of our lights to be in compliance. Um, they estimate that actually only a few older street lights would need to be replaced and that all other street lights are actually dark sky compliant. Um, but we would not know this, uh, the full financial impact until we complete a formal lighting audit, which is a requirement um, in order to even submit an application. It's basically, you're going around taking pictures of the individual fixtures, taking a light reading of it, and then um, compiling all of that document for city-owned lighting. In terms of parks for, and recreation, uh, many of the sports fields and court lighting are old and would not comply with the Lumen or Kelvin requirements, um, but almost all of the lights are on timers and turn off by 10 p.m. Um, some of the parking lot lights are on a timer until midnight, but they could be moved up to 10 p.m. if needed. Uh, and this is basically just to allow a little more of a buffer between events for safety. And so, you know, why does dark sky lighting matter? Well, this was an actual, this was a recent code case that happened. Um, the, this was brought to our attention by a resident of Belagave. As you can see, uh, you can't really see the picture of the fixture to the left-hand side, but it's kind of a spotlight. Um, but the picture from the right-hand side is taken from her neighborhood, and you can see that it's supposed to be lighting um, a personal storage, an RV storage lot, but it is actually um, kind of lighting the entire area and directed towards the neighborhood. And so Code Compliance worked with SRP um, to change out the lighting fixtures. And this is what it looked like afterwards. And I think the biggest thing to note between the two pictures is this one you can actually see the mountains in the background, where this one you cannot. Um, so I thought that was a, a really interesting view of you know, what dark sky lighting can actually do for the community. And um, so just like a summary of findings, um, the zoning ordinance would need to be amended to meet the minimum um, requirements of a dark sky community, which we have been working on and we are getting very close to the point that we would be able to um, or feel comfortable submitting that information to a dark sky program manager. In terms of cost to the city, um, I said this uh, last time I presented, but it would, city owned lighting would have to come into compliance within five years. Um, but a lot of the lights are currently being retrofitted, so um, we hopefully would be able to reach uh, compliance within that five years, but again, um, that's why the light audit is important. And cost to the community, um, all outdoor lighting must comply within 10 years. And that was basically set into place because 10 years is kind of the, um, the IDA's timeline of when a light um, will fail. So within 10 years, it'll probably get old, you'll replace it, it'll break. Um, so they think that 10 years is a good buffer to allow people to meet uh, the minimum standards. So if we were told to go proceed and go forth and apply to be a dark sky community, 
what would the next steps in the application process be? Um, potentially forming a dark sky task force to assist in the application process. This is not required. Um, it is optional, but it is highly recommended. In speaking with the program manager for dark skies, um, many of the cities, especially in Arizona, who have reached a designation as a dark sky community have some other committee that has helped them gather all of the data and information and compile the application before submitting it. Um, we would need to update the zoning ordinance perform a light inventory, and then host at least two community outreach events. That is a minimum requirement before you can even submit an application. Um, they understand that with COVID right now, things are different in how events are being held, and so we're seeing, they're seeing a lot of virtual events that you know might be an easier way for us to meet that requirement. And that pretty much concludes my presentation. If you guys have any specific questions, um, I will do my best to answer. I have a question. So we've always wanted a walkable downtown restaurant district. And with Dino's moving to where they're moving, we've already got handlebars, dirt water, captains around the corner, La Casita, and whoever moves into Village Inn. And it's very dark there. Winter time, it gets dark now early. So we can add more lights as long as they're compliant and facing down, correct? And Correct. Um, with a lot of, from my understanding, with commercial districts, you kind of have a lumen cap um, as to not overlight, but you're not restricted from adding lights, especially um, when it comes to safety of a parking lot. Okay. So parking lot lights aren't required to be turned off at 10 p.m., just the, the lighting on the building? Correct. That is um, that lighting still has to meet the minimum um, Kelvin requirement and shielding, but it is not required to be turned off. Um, I know Fountain Hills is kind of progressive, and we noticed that a couple of their parking lots they're actually on motion sensors. So once the business closes, the parking lights go off. But if someone were to drive through that area, they would turn on. So that is an option that um, commercial centers could consider. I, I, one of the concerns that I have. Um, and experiencing break-ins and theft is break-ins and theft for businesses and residents. Um, I know Fountain Hills, I don't know what their, their rate is compared to us, and um, it's a, definitely a concern because I've experienced it personally a lot. Um, hate having to say that, but, you know, it's a... And so my other concern is the cost to residents are they going to be you know if this is going to be um, a code compliance issue are we throwing more regulations on residents to to comply and will they be cited if they don't what does that look like so what do uh, going along that for security motion lights is there a limit on how many motion lights you can have Let's say you do have a mechanic shop or a jewelry shop in that in an area like that, and somebody's working on the back door. I mean, is that affected? Did, did um, I'm not aware that you're limited to the amount of lights you have. They just have to meet the requirements of being um, shielded. And they would only they come on for what 30 seconds or so. So, <coughs> Krista, what do you think of giving the bu the business owners that option to do motion security lights? We might want to hear from the business owners and we might want to hear from our chief about their thoughts. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the chief, or I know he has experts on SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, sometimes you can overlight. By overlighting, you create shadows and things like that. I'm not an expert myself, but they obviously, there are folks that are certified in it. They work with landscaping, they work with lighting, and I just know that a lot of times if you overlight, then you can create shadows and dark spaces and things like that. So crime prevention is not all just about lighting. It is about, you know, having, you know, not too much landscaping, not enough still has to meet our landscape codes, et cetera. Yeah. And then um, in terms of the residents, I think that's why it's the 10 years. I mean, all, a lot of pictures have a life cycle. And so there was a picture of a slide up there uh, on smoke tree. And so part of this whole thing is educating the community, having these events, but good neighbor lighting, um, that was an example where we got a code complaint. We called that neighbor and they have a huge yard light. It actually looks like a street light you would see at an intersection, it's actually in their yard. They went and they put up a shroud on it at probably minimal cost 
And uh, so they complied by just actually shielding what they had. So not every single light in the city. Uh, that question when I drove around with uh, Vice Mayor Wilson, well, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't comply now. So a lot of this is just education. You know, do you want to see the night sky or not? That's really what it boils down to. As a community, do you want to be able to see that mountain from your backyard, or do you just want to look at the lights that are shining on, you know, I don't more, think, more nuisance type I lighting, I guess. I don't think it's a one size fits all throughout our city, though. I think there's a difference in living in the rural area closer to the mountain and living right down here in the downtown. And I don't think lighting, as far as safety, I don't think we're over lighting as far as making our downtown safe and walkable. I think it's pretty dark, actually, when and you I walk And I didn't say that at all. Us. What I said was that you can overlight that right. doesn't help your safety. Yeah. But yes, there's difference in residential and what you want to sit in your backyard and see versus if you're on Apache Trail that used to be a U.S. highway, what are the expectations? So yes, you can have different zones based on lighting. It's just that overlighting, I mean, I thought it was novel that they, a uh, O'Reilly's shut their, not only their lights off in the store, on the building, and in the parking lot. And then when someone came in to, that shouldn't be there, all the lights <laughs> came on. So again, the, everything was on a timer. I talked yeah. to, the, to the store manager and he said, everything's on a timer, everything shuts off, but it comes back on in case somebody's there that shouldn't be there, yeah. so. I just don't think it's a one size fits all. I didn't say, suggest that you were saying that. I'm no, I agree. It's I not a one size fits all. We should possibly look at different areas in the community. And you can do that. You, you can do that. But the lighting, and it's easy. Everything that gets built today, everything, <clears throat> the Dutch Bros, everything that gets built in the last 15 years has complied with our dark sky, including what the city has done here at City Hall. And so I think that's why the 10 years for compliance for residential, five years for cities, because you do, and there are programs out there for. Um, talking to Mike Weaver that you can get, um, you know, and, and these programs are widely known to go in and get assistance. M mainly it was energy savings. You could get energy savings by switching over to LEDs and then you would have the dark sky compliant fixtures kind of at the same time. So we're concerned too that we don't want to go out and retrofit, you know, a thousand street lights. That would be cost prohibitive and I think for residents too is we don't want to make it onerous but we also want I, I guess, again, it's, it's really what are the overall desires of the community? What, what does the community want to get out of it? Any more questions? Yeah, yeah, so essentially everything this city has done in the past decade would be uh, dark sky compliance as far as things we would have to meet. <clears throat> Commercial and w anything the city has done. And I guess I would do the same thing we did is go, go to Fountain Hills. Go spend an evening in Fountain Hills. Don't spend any money. Spend it here and then go. <laughs> but, um, go to Fountain Hills, drive around, and get a feel for it. Uh, again, it's a different community. I recognize that, and so is Cottonwood and Sedona and Flagstaff. They're all different communities. They have all taken different approaches. I don't think it is a one-size-fits-all. The IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, has requirements. You've got to meet these minimum requirements, mm -hmm. and they kind of work with you. But I think you see what, how, from a business perspective, it works. They have some older strip centers and then they have new shopping centers and how, I mean, it was amazing to me that someone, we have seven monument signs for the fries. So you go to Target and you think, oh, there's the Target there and they've shut their monument sign off. So again, if something's open 24 hours, you have a Walgreens that's open 24 hours, that sign stays on till 24 hours. So it's, uh, it's, it's one hour after business close um, or 10 o'clock, but if the business is open till 1 a.m., then the lights are on till 1 a.m. You know, they do want to think about safety for the employees, too. You work at a bar, a restaurant, they close at one. You know, you kind of work with folks to keep the lights on until the employees all get home safe. Isn't Fountain Hills generally considered upscale? <laughs> I think we're upscale. I yeah. think they, they don't have anything it, we got Compared here, so. to the... But again, I just think it's, it's how it affects the business community. I think that's really kind of what we thought was this would be, we don't want to do something that's not going to you know, work well with the business community, but I think they've found a way to work with it for business that have been there. Fountain Hills has been, part of their city has been established for 40. Since the 70s. Yeah. yeah, so I think you can see it what an old strip center versus a brand new target. It gives you, there is kind of a contrast there that you can see by just taking a ride out there some night. Larry, oh, sorry. Do you know, does SRP or APS have any kind of a, um, 
do they work with cities on changing the street lights that they own? Like in Sunrise Canyon, those were SRP street lights. Do they work with Yeah, and I think they work very well. In this particular case, this was an unusual one where the SRP owned the poles, but they're really lighting a private property. It's a uh, mini storage and uh, RV storage lot, and because the poles were there, because I asked SRP, wouldn't, wouldn't you rather have the customer have a bunch of lights inside their, their facility rather than you trying to light them all? Mm -hmm. And they found some fixtures and it worked. Mm -hmm. um, as far as other, I think they would work very well with us. And I think even as an organization, uh, working with Janine, it was like Janine Rehovit is the right, is, the, is the rep. They'll help us. Yeah. She basically, from the inside, she's also trying to get the culture of that organization to change, as well to uh, help communities out. So I think she was very much having the organization uh, be involved in it. Yeah, it was. Fr it was from a perspective of definitely the, having the right lighting mm -hmm. and doing what they can to help assist. And they were great to work with. And they have been over project, on this particular yeah. project. And I know through through the years with Public Works. When residents have had issues, they've come and help put shields up and help keep it out of their houses. We have these street light districts. So the um, within a development that has city streets and there are assessment districts for those lights. Um, so in theory, most of them should be the newer subdivision should comply. But if not, through the assessment district, when the lights go out, again, I don't know that you know they're all going to go out or be replaced you know, on a schedule, but I think even with working with those street light districts to try to replace some lights over time, because then you kind of have a revenue source. Mm -hmm. So most of the sodium vapor um, and high pressure sodium lights are going away. Everything is going to LED. So then the real key is to not have the white slash blue light, but to go move to the, the warmer yellowish uh, amber light. So they do make amber LEDs too. Did everybody get their questions in? Uh, of course, as you all know, I live in the, the rural part of our community, and um, there's several of us that have, I'll say, floodlights that we flood up the general area where our animals are, are or even in an area where we would exercise our animals. During the summertime, you exercise your animals in the evenings and at, at night because of the wonderful temperatures that we have been experiencing. Uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> 10 o'clock comes awfully early, <clears throat> and you had gone beyond. So would the lights still have to be off by 10 when you're Again, it's the, wattage. Arena? It's, it's the wattage. So I, our current ordinance allows you to have a 150-watt light yes. bulb. And so this would lower it to 60. So retrofitting some of those light bulbs with and shielding them then as well. So I think then, that then combination limit, could do that. Then you limit, then you'd have to increase the number of uh, lighting fixtures that you'd have to have out there. You, you may so, you know, so we we're, one size fits all. We can't say what all 2,000 properties out there, what, what's going to work for them. So we know, I think, just I think off the top of my head, there's probably a couple thousand of those rural acre and a quarter lots. Mm -hmm. So ev everybody has an individual need. Some are using old style yard lights and they, those could be put shrouded on. Some of those have the picture like the cobra head, but individuals using spotlights, if it was, um, the other thing we have to look at again is with dark sky. Right now, our current ordinance says 150 watt. That's a pretty powerful uh, spotlight or, or uh, mm -hmm. you know, directional light. So a 60 can put out a lot of light. A 60 watt LED puts out uh, probably almost what a 100 watt regular incandescent would do. So um, again, I think it's going to ma uh, matter as to how you light, where you light, and then it's all really about being good neighbor. I, you know. I think you were the first person that alerted me to these residential complaints. Mm -hmm. And I went and sat some in somebody's backyard at 10 o'clock at night and saw what, hey, that guy got a new spotlight. This is what I have to look at. Did you go talk to your neighbor? Did you, you know, do they have things that you can put on a timer? So um, but back I don't know if I have a right <laughs> answer for you. I just know, yes, it's, there's going to be an educational component. And I don't know if someone uses spotlights because they ride at night arenas, those type of things, I think we can work with folks, you know. But if someone should be like in a position where Vice Mayor Wilson is, they would have a decade to change that lighting. Yes, they but, would. But back to his question, does his have to go off at 10 o'clock? His night? does. I don't know about anybody else, but for her, <laughs> for sure his. <laughs> oh, 
1030, we'll give them until 1030. But seriously. No, there's no requirement on, it, it's the business lighting that was that's 10 o'clock and that's usually that's it's the sports lighting. There's no requirement that a homeowner has to shut their lights off at 10 o'clock. It's really what can you do to be a good neighbor? Right. What can you do to shield it? What can you do to kind of bring the wattage down? Which we should be changing the culture on that on a lot of aspects of the community. And again, it is all education. Having you know events as part of whatever event we have at a rodeo, having a booth there and things like that that are explaining to people what, you know, what, what the dark sky can mean for the community. Anything else? I just have one. Yes. Comment. So <clears throat> this is probably a, an important thing because there's, there's a lot of, you know, um, questions and some people are, you know, on the fence about it. Moving forward with this application does not commit the city to anything. Is that correct? I mean, we can at the last second say, oh, it's not for us and we're just done. And we're not out any sort of financial burden because we're not investing into things. This, this is yeah, just the time. Yeah, that's the it's the volunteers on a sure. committee, the staff time that it would take to go through it. Um, the inventory piece, it sounds like it's gotten easier. They actually have an app on the phone and a device that you that they can loan you or you can buy it. Yeah. They used to have to go to every single light pole on a street and measure it. Now you just do one and say times 10 or times 20. So the inventory is a lot quicker. That device costs about $800 to buy that device. You can borrow it if they have it available. Again, this is a worldwide organization. So this is, they, I don't know if that thing ships to New Zealand or wherever, but that was, that's a cost. There's staff time costs. He said on average, it depends on how far along you are and how much work you can get volunteers to do. Sometimes they have volunteer committees that basically put 90% of the application together. The application is anywhere on the short end from 50 pages to on average 100, 150 pages. Mostly the committee who's interested in it, you have to have buy-in in even order to move forward. So if there's not buy-in, then we're wasting a lot of people's time. But yes, you don't, you don't have to pull the trigger, so to speak, till the very end. You may decide at the end, we've done all this inventory. It's just too costly for the city to go forward, so you decide not to do it. But you really don't get anywhere unless you actually do the inventory, see if you can form a committee of folks who really are interested in this that can be educating you know, other folks. But yeah, there will be, on average, I think a couple hundred hours, uh, two to three hundred hours is what he said average is to put an application together. Ideally, you would get a committee of volunteers to do, you know, some of the legwork. Okay, I'm looking for a motion on something. Your Honor. Yes. Um, I would move, I presume there's a motion already in here. I'm sorry, I didn't look at it. Oh. I move his staff be directed to number one, try to, oh, staff disappeared. There you are. <laughs> number one, try to form a committee. We need to know if people are interested enough to do this before, you know, we move too far. And if <clears throat> that committee gets formed, then I would direct staff to do a light inventory. So the motion was to do a form a committee, a volunteer committee, and then to do a light inventory. inventory. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Roll call. <laughs> Council Member Evans. Yes. Council Member Rizzi. Yes. Council Member Struble. Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes. Council Member Barker. Yes. Council Member Schroeder. Yes. Mayor Surdy. Yes. Motion passes, Your Honor. We have a motion on up to upcoming of council dates. Your Honor, I move that an executive session at 6 p.m. and a work session at 7 p.m. for Monday, October 19th and Tuesday, October 20th, 2020, be held in the City Council Conference Room and City Council Chambers located at 300 East Superstition Boulevard. Apache Junction, Arizona, respectively, and other need other meetings if necessary. Second. Roll call. Vice Mayor Wilson. Yes. Council Member Barker. Yes. Council Member Rizzi. Yes. Council Member Schroeder. Yes. Council Member Struble. Yes. Council Member Evans. Yes. Mayor Surdy. Yes. Unanimous, Your Honor. This is the time for the public to express requests, communications, comments, and suggestions. Each speaker must have already filled out a request to speak for him and handed it to the city clerk before the end of the city manager's report. All issues shall be presented in a professional manner without personal attacks. 
Under the open meeting law, the council cannot engage in discussion on the issues presented, but may respond to criticism and may direct staff to follow up with the speaker directly and or place this matter on a future agenda for council discussion. There's a three minute time limit for each speaker and I have George Schroeder. I had to pick the night to come, right? Okay. George Schroeder, 244 West Virginia. <clears throat> Rapid fire. Hmm. So we need more communication on your community activities. I've got the focal point. I've got the AJ Facebook gap. I got, you know, whatever. I'm not getting any of your uh, uh, communications in terms of these activities. Uh, touch the last one. My first thing, I came down in 82 to visit a friend, Joe Bonanno. Mm -hmm. Anyway, come through Tucson. The bungalows, the lighting was perfect. I thought this was like a great western city from the 1800s. It was beautiful. Little, like, they looked like little campfires, not lights. It was beautiful. That was in Tucson. <clears throat> was, so I thought this is what I was coming to. When I first came to Arizona, that's what I thought I was going to live in. <clears throat> Welcome to Apache Junction. Thank you. So you're dark skies. We don't have to go to Fountain Hills, but it's a good reference. So we can go to Gold Canyon. Over 20 years, I've, 25 years, 30 years, I've watched it grow. I lived out there. The top of the mountain is wonderful. So I see all the lights that have come. They're still minimal. Maybe they can afford these uh, nice things. But um, yeah, you want to reflect what's there, what's here, and what's there. So we need to do more than just look at there and there. With, the, with In terms of the lighting, I like it. I like the idea. We need less lighting. And then we have security concerns because your good neighbor policy, not working out so well. <clears throat> I'm living proof. <laughs> <clears throat> I try to be a good neighbor. <clears throat> I have a new neighbor, and let's see how that goes. I cut her tree for her today. She's happy. The Brookfield uh, entity that's going down with the annexed land, I don't know if that's a requirement that we have to have. I don't know if it's a done deal. Um, I just think that we're not going to get any benefit from that. We're going to get all the liability. We're not going to get the taxes. That's going to the airport. Make no mistake about it. We're not going to see any benefit. Um, we do need to see more uh, business, but um, <clears throat> I'm glad we got all the appointments to the boards. I've been requested to <laughs> be on a few of them. I don't have the time. I'm, I got my hands full. Thank you very much. Um, congratulations to the people who got elected, and sorry for if, if you didn't. Um, still looking to see what the percentage of money is that a federal, county, state give to our uh, Health and Human Services committees. Because um, we're giving them money, and they're already getting money to get office, they get everything paid for, and we're giving them more. Would anyone care to respond? No, thank you. With that, we'll be re <laughs> convened. <laughs> 